Hello and welcome to the Self-Recording Band Podcast. I am your host, Benedict Hein. If you are new to the show, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. If you are already a listener, welcome back. So stoked to have you. Today, we are back with our usual episodes. So we had a bunch of like interviews in a row, I think. Um, and so now we are back to one of the Malcolm and Benny ones, like you've been used to for, I don't know, probably 190 episodes at this point. And uh, <laughs> yeah, we're going to talk about how to... Like what to do if you walk into a new studio, a new room, how to make that work. Let's say when you record at a jam space that you've never been before, when you record your friends, or if you move to a new room with your own band, if you get new gear, you know, um, and need to set it up and work with it, whatever. Like you, you're going to probably at some point run into a situation where you have to deal with a new environment, new gear, new room, and we gonna, we're going to share our thoughts on that and how to deal with that, and we'll share our experience with that. And as always... I'm doing this with my friend and co-host, Malcolm Owen Flood. How are you, Malcolm? Glad to have you back <laughs> in this format. Hey, Betty. Yeah, man. <laughs> it is good to be back at this. And I mean, we, we had our chat with uh, Christian Cole yeah. uh, last week, which was awesome because I was kind of close to being back to the original format as well. Um, but yeah, no, stoked to be back. Man, I've had a crazy few weeks since we... <laughs> really? <laughs> like since I got back from Germany, really. Uh, yeah, I, I spent like a full week recording and filming slugs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I saw one of those pictures, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, cool. it was so, but you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like what, what your life is going to be. <laughs> and for me, it was a like a week in a tent filming slugs. <laughs> <laughs> Did you build some of those memes, you know, where the, the, like the, there was this time. Did you remember the social media memes with the, the guitarists with the slug instead of the guitar? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got the best slugs for that now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah. How about you, Benny? How are you? Uh, I'm, I'm doing great. Thank you. Uh, crazy busy weeks as well. We're going. Uh, we're signing up a lot of new coaching students, which is very very exciting. So, by the way, if you want to mm -hmm. join the Self Recording Syndicate, our coaching program, now is a great time. Uh, there's new partnerships in the making. We have met some people at Studios uh, Stena, the conference that we've been to. Um, I'm about to go to Nam really soon to the US. I'm gonna do some. Yeah. Work on some some connections, some collaborations there, and so you're going to benefit from that if you join the academy. That's for sure, or like the, the the coaching program, the syndicate. And also, I just on and this is very like true, very honest. I only have a few spots left. Like we are in high demand right now, and I'm signing up a lot of students, and I got many more calls booked. And there's only it's not going to be long until I can't serve any more people, and uh, I need to pause applications for a while probably until we figure out some new systems. So if you want to do this, uh, please. Please go to the self recording band.com and apply for our coaching program. And uh, it all starts with a free first call. So, no strings attached. We just jump on a call and then see if our program is a great fit for you. I'm going to ask a ton of questions, uh, we'll figure out where you are right now, where you want to be, and whether or not we can help you get there. And, best case scenario, it's a perfect fit and we're going to work together to transform your recordings. Or, worst case scenario, you get an hour of free coaching. But uh, now is a good time to do that because, uh, yeah. Who knows for how long I can offer it like this before I have to do I have to change things. All right. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's been a, a few great weeks. We also launched uh, some of our courses again. Got some exciting projects booked uh, and in the studio. So, yeah. yeah. I wanted to mention the, the course as well, because yeah. I know that like the longtime listeners uh, were around when we released those courses, but we only ever released them in limited time yes. frames. Um, so the, just recently, if you missed out on the Mixes Unpacked series um, or any of the other mini courses that have also come up, um, they're now actually available all the time. Yes. So I think that's really cool. I'm excited for people to be able to get access to those. Yes, 100%. So all of this will be in the show notes um, of this episode. So if you're listening on a podcast app, just go to the show notes and you see the links there. If you are on YouTube, it's going to be in the description. Um, so this is a video podcast as well, by the way. And the link to the courses, the best way to get them actually is to go uh, to, at least at this point, is to go to the selfrecordingband.com slash mixready. Because if you go there, you'll see our mix ready course which is sort of the um, the recording course and the one thing that is relevant for every self-recording band, regardless of whether you're, you're mixing or not. Um, this is something everybody needs. And then there's something called the Everything Bundle that you'll also find on this page, where in addition to the Mix Ready course, you'll get our Mixes Unpacked courses, you get an editing course, um, like all the things we have to offer at a discounted rate. And so, if yeah, if you go to the selfrecordingband.com slash mixready, all of that will be there. But then, of course, there's the individual courses, the selfrecordingband.com slash mixes unpacked or dead on drums, the editing course, all of that will all be in the description 
of this episode. And yeah, these are publicly available now. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been an exciting few weeks. And one of the things is actually, one of the things that happened is actually a good segue into this episode, Malcolm, because both of us are considering a kind of production uh, comeback, right? <laughs> sort of a <laughs> kind of. <laughs> um, like, I'm, I'm thinking about coming back from, from my production retirement in a way. Not, not entirely. I'm going to be focusing on mixing still. But uh, I got yeah. a uh, yeah, a request to produce a record in the US, actually. So I, it looks like, as of now, it looks like I'm going to be traveling to NAM, to Los Angeles in January. And then right after that, I'm going to produce a record with someone in the US again. And I'm looking forward to that. So... Yeah, that's crazy cool. Yeah. I, yeah, to fill people in, both Benny and I only mix and master in music. That's like the only involvement we have anymore, other than being educators, yeah. of course. Yeah. Um, but we we both stopped engineering and producing for bands in studio. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I also got an offer. Just like the timing's funny because we both got offers at the same time. I mean, it's it's not actually. Like we've both probably gotten a bunch yes, of offers, but for yes. some reason we're both considering them at the yes, same time. <laughs> that's the thing. I get offers all the time, but I I I decided yeah. not to produce anymore, not to engineer anymore. So yeah, exactly. and now I'm for the. F- but for yeah. some reason we're both like, how oh, that? I think you know what? It, it's probably like we're going to talk about in this yeah. <laughs> this episode. We spent some time in the studio yeah. together while we <laughs> yeah. were in Germany, we're in probably. Hamburg for studios, and we're like, this is kind of yeah. fun. <laughs> yeah, probably that. Yeah, it, really, honestly, I just want to do that. it every once in a while for select you know projects, just because. Yeah, just because of that, it's fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I feel like it. This is one the project I'm considering. It's like one that I could. It's going to be you know hired gun session players, a band in a room, great uh, tracking like a lot of the bed tracks live off the floor, and with like the best musicians available. Awesome. So I'm like, well, how could I not have a good time doing that? <laughs> yes, yes, totally, totally. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah same here. Like, um, yeah, the, a certain projects, it's. I don't know. I just want to do it because it's fun. And then also, like you said, if it's someone where if you don't have all these limitations, if there's a decent budget and great musicians and you can make a really good record where you just know it's going to be fun with good people and a good result at the end, um, why not? And also, I'm a big believer in if I, we're, ed- we're uh, educators, right? And I'm teaching people how to record all the time. And I feel like if mm-hmm. I don't do it every once in a while at least, I kind of, how can I teach it? So, I, I mean, I've done a yeah. fair share of like records and I know how it all works and stuff, but still, I got to keep it fresh. I, there's things change sometimes and I think I need to, I still need to practice every now and again. And and so, so I don't want to be one of those people who hasn't made a record in years, but still teaching it. So this is also part of it. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, no, that makes a, a ton of sense to me. Um, Want to stay on, like, stay fresh and, and ahead of the curve and know what's going on with new techniques and stuff like that. Um, you're a little more crazy than I in that you're considering doing, like, an entire album. I'm doing one song max, and then I'm out. Yeah, no, it's, it's going to be an EP, <laughs> like, five to seven songs. An EP? Okay, but it's great. just the perfect timing, yeah. right? You know, because the it's, like, coincidence. It's it's There's Nam, and then right after that, the artist who contacted me wants to do this record, and it's he's in the U.S., so I'm like, well, when I'm in Los Angeles anyways... I can just, you know, book another flight and go to wherever you are and uh, we'll make this record together. And, you know, it, sometimes, I don't know, there, I feel like the universe wants to tell me something. <laughs> and I just, yep, I should just do it. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, this is it. And uh, so we'll see how that all goes. Um, the contract is not signed yet. So I, I don't say the name of the artist and anything because, like, I just don't want to, you know, say anything that that's not going to happen but it, yeah, we, we talked about it and it's it's i'm pretty sure it's going to happen and there's another record with a band that i uh, i've worked with in the past year where i probably will produce drums when the time comes next year cool. uh, it's also going to be fun so yeah a few projects um here yeah there. keeps it fresh exactly, I love exactly. It. cool so before we dive into this episode now uh there's one more thing i want to mention because i really love that i got an email from one of our listeners and this email came from jen so jen wrote he or she I, i'm not really sure it's just this jen i assume she but could you know i don't know when applying for a one-on-one call in the questionnaire uh so so the person applied for coaching or was trying to apply for co- for our coaching so if you do that you have to go through a application form that walks you through step by step. You have to fill in a bunch of like, yeah, answer a bunch of questions. And then we look at this application, listen to your music, and then decide if you want to do the call or not, if you're a great fit for the program. So uh, that person said, when applying for a one-on-one call, 
In the questionnaire, I realized something. While, yes, I have been listening to your podcast, I've not implemented the things you talk about. So I figured to show you that I'm serious, I need to go and apply at least some of the grasp knowledge that I have before asking you for more. You'll hear from me again. Thank you, Chen. And I oh. love this email. I really, That's really love it. Because the que part of the reason I have this questionnaire is I want to work with people who are serious. I want to work with people where I know, like, if I help this person, it's going to be awesome. Like, they're going to put in the work. They really want to improve. They are coachable. Um, they are open-minded. They, you know, it's like it's for some people, you can't just you can't do something like that with with them. And and I, I'm yeah. looking for the right people. And this just made my day because, first of all, she said or he said that uh, they got like knowledge from the podcast, which I love. And then also the fact that someone would stop the application process and be like, "Hey, I should implement stuff first to show you that I'm serious." Love it. It's perfect. Yeah, that that's a. Uh That is the perfect thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so thank you very much, Jen. It's so hard to do that. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much, Jen. And everyone listening, be like Jen. Like, don't just listen to our podcast. Uh, I mean, it's cool if you listen to it, but um, there's so much knowledge. There's so many like little nuggets in there, so many things you can apply. If you just applied, I don't know, 10% of it, um, it would be a lot. And you, your records would be a lot yeah. better. So just, just be like Jen. Ap apply the stuff and then take yeah. it a step further. Yeah. <laughs> 100%. I, I had, uh, I mean, I used to co-host another podcast. I swear we're going to get to the episode soon. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had uh, another podcast called The Self, or sorry, that's this yeah. one, right? The <laughs> Self-Recording yeah, Man. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, it's, uh, it's early here, yeah. yes. Uh, the, Your Band Sucks at Business was the name of the podcast. It's still up there if anybody wants to check it out, and people still do, which is really great. Um, but we had a listener, Danny Blonde, who's a great artist as well. She took like full page notes of every episode and was like, shared some of them into our community and stuff like that it was like so awesome to see yeah. somebody like that dedicated yeah this is like yes you're studying love it absolutely love that yeah totally so yeah thank you jen for this message i figured i want to share it on the episode and uh, i hope you you uh, you get great results from implementing what we teach here and then i really hope to hear from you again this is great Yes. Awesome. So, to today's episode. Now, walking into a new studio or room or both, um, new, maybe even with new musicians, new people, new situation, basically. How to make that work. We just did something like that. We just went uh, to Hamburg together, Malcolm and I, and, and Thomas and Wayne, so the team here. And we spent a week at a houseboat that had a studio built into it, which was very cool. Um, but we had to deal with that new studio. We didn't bring our own gear, uh, just a bunch of, you know, mics and cables and stuff. But, like, basically we used what was there. And so we had to figure out the routing. We had to figure out the gear, the mics, the room, everything. And we made it work and recorded some drum samples in there. And so, yeah, we just had this kind of situation. And we want to walk you through a couple of things that, you know, you could do or like, that you could run into so that you're prepared when that ever happens to you. Yeah. yeah, it's uh we weren't very prepared for this. <laughs> <laughs> we went in walking in like we're going to make some cool sounds and we essentially spent that day routing. <laughs> yeah, to to totally. I mean, we d we did what we could in a way because we asked the studio owners um about like what gear is there and you know, but there's in hindsight there could be there could have been more that I could have asked about the routing and stuff. Uh so yeah, um definitely room for improvement there. Um and it also Yeah, basically that. We just assumed that everything's going to work, but sometimes it doesn't, at least not the way you expect it to be. There's other people using the same room. You know, you never know who who's in there before you. They might have changed something, nobody yep. noticed, and then all of a sudden you have to figure out stuff that should be um, on, you know, should be... Yeah, the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> Then it's not. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Things change the studios all the time. Yeah, constantly plugging different things into other things, and sometimes things get put back in the wrong way. And it, uh, yeah, knowing how to troubleshoot and get it going is essential. Yeah. So I don't know about you, Malcolm, but the first thing I do when I walk into a new room um, is I don't actually look at. The, I mean, I look at the gear because I love gear. But the first thing I do is I actually check out the room. I want to get a feel for what the room sounds like, like where. Uh, what, what could, you know, which potential problems could we run into? What does the, you know, the, the vibe, the whole acoustics, like the first impression I get from it, is it very lively? Is it very dark? Is it, you know, that kind of thing is like the first thing I pay attention to. And I immediately in my mind, I'm like, okay, where could we put certain things? How we could, how, how could we set up in here? Where's a good spot for the monitoring and all of that? So this is kind of the first thing I do when I walk into a new room, check out the room itself, basically. And then based right. off of yeah. that, I make other decisions in terms of gear and whatever. Awesome. Yeah, no, that that does make a lot of sense. Um, and and learning the room could be 
uh, very different depending on the scope of what you need to do yeah. there. Do you need to set up, you know, like a mo- like a control station for running like your computer and interface and all of that and like listening to the recorded playback as well? Or is that already like built into the studio and you just need to worry about where you're going to put the different instruments? You know, is there going to be a live band set up like, with everybody in the same room? That's going to take, you know, a more thorough approach to learning the room and figuring out how you're going to make it work. Um, and also just spotting the assets in that room. Do they have gobos, which are movable things you can use to block sound from hitting other, like, you know, block block a guitar amp off from hitting a drum kit, for example, with a gobo. Um, tools like that, which can, you know, allow you to manipulate the room into what you need. Yes, absolutely. Totally. And what you see a lot of people do when they walk into a new room is they walk in and they immediately start to clap on, and listen to like the reverb of the room and the room sound. And it kind of makes sense. But what I do um, is if I have the option, if I'm recording a full band and if I know that I'm recording, you know, um, uh, if, drum, drums, for example, or anything with low end. So usually, if you walk around the room and you you clap, you hear two things. You hear the decay, like the length of the room in a way, like if there's a ton of reverb or not. But if it's a very controlled, smaller room, like a jam space, you probably won't hear much there. What you can hear, though, then, in addition to that, what you can hear is flutter echo. So if there is, like, two parallel walls without treatment and you stand in between them and you clap, then sometimes you hear this, like, very fast slap sort of echo. Um, you want to avoid, for many instruments, you want to avoid spots where this is, like, the case and you want to either treat one of the walls or you move to a different spot or you know do something about that so that can help a little bit but what i do is there's something i teach in the in our coachings and courses as well that is the like what i call the floor tom trick where uh you unless i immediately know that wherever the drum kit is it kind of sounds good and i just walk around and listen and i feel like okay this is a good spot like on that boat that corner was actually really cool because in the corner you have low end build up and it just worked but oftentimes i will walk around the room with a floor tom in my hand as weird as that looks and sounds and i will hit the floor tom and i just listen to how the low end um, develops basically or how it how it sounds because there will be spots in the room where you feel like there's almost no low end and it ca- sounds kind of small then there are spots where it's out of control and very boomy and then there are spots where it just sounds just right where it's like tight full low end but not too long and and this is to me is very important because the higher frequencies are easier to deal with but if i find a good spot for a drum kit where i have a good full low end without it being completely out of control this is where i want to set up and, only if the room is like big enough and you have a lot of like options, but uh, that's something I really love to do, and it teaches me a lot about the room. And yeah, I just I don't know for some reason the low end is what I what I listen to mainly when I do that. Yeah, yeah no, I think that makes a lot of sense. And the other advantage of something like a floor tom or a kick drum is that yeah, they have low yeah. end, which is their biggest benefit because if you grab a snare, there's not a lot of low end, yeah. right? Or if you strum an acoustic guitar, there's not a lot of low end. So it's harder to know if that's there. But even though it is a lot of low end on a floor tom, for example, it still has all of the rest, yeah. you know? It still has top yeah. end. So you kind of get a full yeah. picture rather than a clap, which is just top end. Yeah. Yeah, so you can do that if you want to f- find a good spot for the drum kit in the room. Uh, that's one of the things you can do. And then, um, yeah, but I, f- I think just get a feel for the room. I think just, you know, walk around there, just talk, you know, play guitar, play a drum kit, whatever, and just get a feel for how the room sounds and, and really pay attention to that because you can't get the room out of the recording, really. It's always going to be part of it. And as you said, Malcolm, maybe there's ways to control a certain part of it or a corner of it or isolate certain things. But, like, put some thought into the room before, like, yeah, not, not just worry, don't just worry about the gear, but also put some thought into the room. It's really, really important. Yeah, no, it's great. Um, one more pro tip. Mm-hmm. While you're walking around with that floor tom, what you're hearing is where your ears are. Oh yeah, right. Not necessarily where the drum is. So you're, you're but that's important too. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you're hopefully going to discover, you know, where to put a drum kit, for example. But you're also going to pick up on spots that are a great place to put microphones. Yeah. Right. So you can like once you find you know your spot for your drum kit have the drummer set up there and start playing and walk around. And now you're finding your room mic spots yeah. with your ears, right? So, it, you know, pay attention to it for instrument placing placement, but also for uh, microphone placement. Totally. That's what we've done when we recorded those. We recorded some drum samples on that houseboat in that studio. And when Thomas was sitting down at the drums and hitting drums, I was walking around the room or we were walking around the room just listening for... Um, 
you know, different aspects of like different characters, basically. So we were listening for where does the snare sound cool? Where do we get a lot of punch? Then there were spots in the room where it like sounded really thin. There were other spots where it sounded really punchy and had a lot of body. And we just found spots that we think sounded cool and balanced. And and it's it, it's crazy how much of a difference it makes, even if just moving a few feet back or forth, it's like a, a, a world of a difference. So. Yeah, totally. I found one spot just playing with my yeah. camera. I was filming you do something and I just like went into the sound. I was like, oh, we got to put something here. And it sounded super big yeah. there. It was like a no-brainer. Um, one, one more tangent on this topic. It's really easy to look with your eyes and not with your mm -hmm. ears when you're doing this. And like, we did this. Oh, yeah. We, we, we saw, we're on a house yeah. and And like, there's nothing wrong with looking with your eyes. You could find something cool that is out of the ordinary. Uh, I'll give one more example before I tell you our fail. <laughs> um, but one more example is at Silverside Sound, the studio down on the road from me there's like this big wine cask oh, a big yeah. huge barrel and it's got a hole in it that perfectly fits like an sm57 <laughs> it's just like it's yes, made this for is that. Be yeah. amazing yeah it sounds terrible <laughs> 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 that is not a thing that would be usable um so looking with our eyes failed us there you know uh what failed us on the houseboat is that we saw these like cool kind of like captain boat windows mm -hmm. they're like port windows mm -hmm. with a big metal class so we opened one up and threw a microphone outside the window, you know, <laughs> out into this river, essentially hanging above it. And uh, that didn't sound good either. It sounded like a river. Yeah. <laughs> you know? like, it's just like, this looks cool, but it looks cool. It doesn't sound yeah, cool. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. So, but still, it can be, sometimes you're lucky, right? You can have a good starting yeah, point. And then, but like, you're totally right. Don't, don't, don't stick with, uh, with the idea if it's just, obviously, if it just doesn't work. So, okay, cool. Now, um, learning the gear. Well, I think when it comes to learning the gear, um, I, I think it just pays off to have some, b before you do that, before you go to a new room, if you know you're going to do that, if you're booked for something like that, or if you plan on like adding new gear or, you know, building a new, new home studio, whatever, you got to have some basic signal flow um, knowledge and some engineering basic skills, basically. Like, this is really what you have to have. You don't have to be the best engineer in the world. You don't have to know everything. But if you know signal flow, like how sound enters, let's say, a channel strip and leaves it and where to send it and how th things like that work, then you can, um, you can operate most gear that's available. It might take you a while to figure it out, but most pieces of gear have some sort of input, some sort of output, and something in between. And if you if you have some basic signal flow knowledge, if you know like the difference between a mic level, a line level, and a DI input, and you know how a channel strip in general works, how a preamp works, what's a preamp, what's a converter, what's a compressor, and where to put these in the chain, um, you're good. Like this is, this is just something I think everyone needs to learn at some point. And yes, of course, many setups these days are very simple. But still, you're, you're going to run into situations where somebody wired something wrong or like they connected your stuff the wrong way. And um, yeah, that's where you have to have these skills. So in our ex example, I was I was sitting down at this like at this desk uh, and wanted, wanted to check out the monitoring, like the monitors that they had there. And I turned on the monitor controller and it was like crazy noisy. And I'm like, hmm. I can't believe this. I can't believe this. Like this monitor controller is that noisy because we knew the monitors. It wasn't them. So I was like, I can't believe they were listening to it like that. Like something's got to be wrong. And I didn't see it in the beginning. But then at some point, I saw that they were plugging in from the Apollo from the interface lineouts, which is correct, not into the line ins of the monitor controller, but into mic pre's because that monitor controller also had mic pre's in it was an interface and a controller. So they were running out of the line and output into some additional mic pre's and then into the monitors, which is completely unnecessary and just adds noise and a weird stereo image. So I just we just unplugged it, put it into the line inputs of the monitor controller, and then we had clean monitoring. So things like that, right? You never know. And you might run into, into something like that. And um, the person working there before you, they might not have known and just, yeah, they've done it the wrong way, and then you have to solve it. Yeah, yeah, you can't really assume that whoever was in there before you knows what they're yeah. doing. And yeah, that was kind of a perfect example. It's like, what the heck is this? Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this isn't good. Yeah. <laughs> and just these basic skills, knowing the different types of levels and connectors, even if you put your own setup together, you buy new gear, no matter which interface you choose or which piece of gear, if you know that stuff, you can you can set up anything because it, all of it will have the same types of inputs. They might be labeled a little differently or look a little different, but like mm -hmm. it's always the same. You always have mic inputs, yeah. line inputs, inputs, instrument inputs, somewhere in there is a converter, uh, and in front of that is a preamp, and then you send it to the computer, and as long as you know those basic things, 
you can handle anything. It doesn't matter what the interface yep. looks like. Absolutely, and and then yeah, knowing. Uh, like the first thing I do, you you mentioned the first thing for you is the room, and that that makes total sense. But for me, my anxiety gets the best of me, and the first thing I do is figure out the I/O oh, yeah. interface, I/O and monitoring, and, and and make sure something can be recorded into the computer. Yeah, probably not a bad thing to check. And you get in there, yeah, yeah. something I want to yeah. record gets recorded. Like they're like I I patch a channel and I test it and and then if i can see it and i can hear it and then and then also that they can hear it like the monitoring is set up correctly for the musician that's going to be recording those are my priorities and i i'll like i would notoriously show up way too early for this because i just like can't handle doing that stuff with the client in the room yeah. it's so stressful to me yeah so <laughs> just i would want to be there as early as possible like a few hours early and just hey this is this working like you know might only take might not take any time might just work right off the, the bat but i'm like ah, good yeah <laughs> totally yeah can you imagine us walking like taking a client with us on that houseboat and and doing what we did like i mean um it wasn't our fault that it was that way and it, it we made it work and the gear was amazing the studio is cool all of that but whoever was bef was there before us they you know did a few let's say unconventional things <laughs> running preamps into preamps and into other preamps so the, that one thing wasn't the only thing that happened so um imagine bringing a client in there assuming everything works and then you have to do what we did basically re rewiring the studio uh like half a day for half a day or something it, this wouldn't it's unacceptable, no, it's unacceptable right? yeah, yeah really yeah and and you you need to know that like more than just the computer side of it you need to know the patch bay you yeah. know if there's like a uh, uh, or a, a patch bay or a snake in like another room you need to be able to okay well i'm going to throw the kick in one what does one translate to on the computer side you know uh, or on the patch yep. bay like it it can get complicated pretty quick depending on how big the studio setup is especially um, if it's not so labeled having that figured out <laughs> yeah yeah which it was not labeled <laughs> yeah. um Labels are good, studio owners. Yeah. Please label your yeah. stuff. <laughs> uh, it, uh, yeah, it, like it really can just kind of destroy your session, and that is no. You don't want people tired and exhausted mentally before they even start recording by trying to figure out what the heck's going on with this rat's nest of cables. Yes, yeah. and that includes yourself, by the way. We're not just talking to yes. producers who work with other people. If you are preparing your own sessions, set up your own home studio, you will be tired yourself. Like you don't want to do that as well. You want to set yourself up for a pleasant experience in the session. And I've seen it's so often when people set up their studio then they don't walk in for a while and then they come back want to record something and then they, they don't remember what they did they didn't label anything and they have to figure it all out again so don't be that person like make it easy for yourself yeah, absolutely yeah 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 make it easy for yourself yeah. um the best time to do it is the night before yeah hands down if you can do a setup day or a setup session you know like the night before or the day before or whatever just get in there mock things up have mics on stands already and just like know that you're going to walk in and turn it on and it's going to be good to go that's the best that's ultimate but not always possible of yeah. course and document um, everything also yeah. make checklists label it you know don't assume you're going to remember because sometimes we think oh well, that's stupid of course i'm going to remember that and trust me sometimes when i thought that like half an hour later i couldn't remember it. so you know it's like yeah. there's often these small things where you're like yeah i'm not stupid i'm gonna of course i'm gonna, I'm gonna know that but no next day chances are you don't know anymore and so just label it <laughs> write it down do, do something like yeah happens to me so often yeah, we, we literally had like yeah our, our snakes were mismatched with our patch bay at this houseboat recording yeah. studio so we were like constantly like yeah seven is ten yeah. and eight is two yeah. right and then like yeah we got that and then we just completely yeah, forget of course because that's impossible yeah. to remember and make sense of you know? yeah. <laughs> um and then rename it in the computer that's another thing we didn't do right off the bat where we were like okay well we could just make this <laughs> we could just rename our io and our computer to make it work but we re will remember and then say like, okay yeah 30 minutes later let's rename yeah, that <laughs> exactly exactly um i got one great horror story yeah. uh or like <laughs> not a horror story but um I started renting a different studio because I've usually operated out of like the, the mothership mm -hmm. model, I would say, um, where I have my mixing and mastering suite here. I can do some overdubs here. But when I was producing bands, I would take a band into a studio, I'd rent a studio to do drums and, you know, big setups. Um, and I started with a new one in, uh, in the city close by. And first day, get the keys, go in. Uh, I've been given a tour and kind of know what's going on a little bit but i didn't get the password for the computer <laughs> shit <laughs> so i fire it up and i can't even log really? in to, <laughs> to open pro tools so it's just like oh no 
<laughs> and you know we're doing an early start it's like six in the morning or something and can't reach the owner <laughs> he's not awake oh god oh god <laughs> yep so we just you know we did made the best of it we just like you know got the instruments tacked real good set up all the mics and i knew i had the patching into the you know the interface correct and all that kind of thing but i just needed to be able to open pro tools so bad yeah and oh god. uh couldn't you yeah <laughs> yeah see that's <laughs> so funny i heard an interview once with steve albini you know the guy who runs everything analog still to this day only tape and no computers and nothing and uh, he said once he entered he, like they do digital recording at his studio but it's not him who does it it's other engineers they provide that op opportunity that, that option but he just works on tape and he said it, w once he ran into a session in one of, of of their studios and there were a bunch of musicians in there and the producer and engineer and everyone and they were they weren't doing anything they were just sitting there and he was like what's going on like aren't you making a record and then one of the guys said well we have to wait because someone forgot a the dongle you know the eye lock or whatever <laughs> lock. and we gotta <laughs> wait until he's back with the dongle and then he just you know, he just laughed out loud it was like there's a room full of musicians and producers and engineers and you can't make a record because someone forgot the fucking dongle <laughs> you know like this is yeah uh it's, you know yeah yeah, there's, happen there's tape definitely machines. these moments where you're like, a tape machine is way more reliable. <laughs> yeah, for sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, I still wouldn't want to use one, though. <laughs> no. <laughs> but yeah, totally. I mean, I would, but like only in certain situations. Um, okay, so things like that happen. And so be prepared, be early, uh, you know, do all the all things we just we just said. Also, I, th I think... Um, I put on the list here 80 20 everything. What I mean by that is you don't sometimes you don't have to make everything work. Make sure that the the bare minimum is working basically. Like you said Malcolm, make sure you have the, make sure that signals arrive at the computer and something can be recorded. If you can't get whatever fancy thing to work, who cares? Like it's it would be nice to have, but like the basics should be covered first and so make sure like whoever is going to be playing or singing that they have no latency on their headphones, make sure that the that you actually record signal and it's you have some kind of, you know, clean uh, monitoring and and do those things first, like the 20% that give you 80% of the result and only if there's time worry about the rest but don't get caught up like you know trying to patch in the fancy compressor or whatever you have there before you yeah. make sure that the basics work like 80 20 everything totally. absolutely yeah absolutely um i i think every studio that i've personally set up a rental for has always agreed to let me come by for like an orientation yeah. in advance yeah so take advantage of that ask for that they, they they want you to succeed in there and rent it more. So they, it makes sense for them to invest some time in showing you how it's set up. Yes, 100%. And by the way, the best is when you rent out a studio. So, and I, I know that the majority of our listeners probably are not producers who rent out other studios all the time, but who knows? You might be in a situation like that at some point. And I just want to say the best is when you got really good staff at the studio, when they have a really good studio assistant or someone who's going to be, at least for the setup, uh, present there and shows you the patch, make sure everything's working and they know what they're doing, those people, like, this is completely underrated. Like those, they, those guys or girls can make or break a session. They are rock stars. Like if they, if there's a good assistant who knows their, their way around the patch bay and knows how to fix things, knows how to get you know whatever you need, um, makes a session so much more pleasant. And uh, I've had that a few times where I was so grateful that someone was present during the setup. Um, and and yeah, the, those people. Don't get you know don't get the credit they deserve sometimes, <laughs> because they they totally. make it happen. And even like the big producers, sometimes they go into studios, they would be lost sometimes without the staff doing a lot of the setup work for them. So, hundred percent, hundred percent, yeah. I th I think even more so actually at that level. Yeah. They're like you know, they're just expecting it to work. Yeah, yeah. That that's a great note. Cool. Also, um, now the next thing is. One thing we skipped here basically is I, I, don't just listen to the room and don't just figure out the gear. Both are important, but also figure out, like, listen to the players in that room and the instruments you have available. Like, you could, if you walk into a new room or if you set up a new jam space, things might sound different compared to where you were last. And maybe you need to tune the drums differently now. Maybe you've always done it a certain way that has always worked for you, but now in the new room, everything's different because of the acoustics. It's, it's crazy how that changes. Um, same with amps. You might have a certain setting that you always liked in your jam space, and that's the way you play, you record, or whatever. If you take that same amp and cap to a new room, completely different. Um, and then, you know, the players themselves too, 
maybe you know um, you bring in a new person or you and somebody new joins the band or I don't know, but like every player sounds different. So yep. also take that into account. And everyone who's ever played live in more than one location knows that a setting on your amp that worked one night might totally fail the next night, depending on you know what the what the stage sounds like and all that. So. Uh, yeah, consider that as well. Don't assume that whatever you did last time is going to work in the new room. So it's always different. 100%. Uh, and, and studios have secret weapons. Which this is actually like my favorite part yeah. about walking into a studio is looking for the secret weapons. Yeah. Um, if, if you're like, fo if you follow any of your local studios pages and you notice that there's always the same mic setup yeah. on something, there's a really good reason for that. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's like they always have the same room mic set up. It's because that's their freaking spot. You know, they, they know that this mic in that spot is like nine out of time, nine, nine out of 10 times a success. Yes. Um, and, and then you might even notice other things like, hey, how come every band that goes in there uses the same symbols? It's because the, that studio has some symbols that they're like, these work yep. here. These really yep. work. So I go snooping. I go snooping. I find their snare rack and I'm like, oh, this one looks the cleanest because or has the most fingerprints on it. <laughs> that's yep. the snare. That's the snare that we're yeah. probably going to keep on reserve when we find out that the drummer's own snare has this crappy skin on it, um, or or it just sucks. <laughs> totally. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Or there's a symbol bag. Ooh, more symbol choices. Yeah. You know, stuff like that. Yeah. And don't don't let your ego get in the way there as well, because you know, just because you might know what you're doing and you might have a favorite way of doing things, but again, in a new room, a new environment, things might be different. And if there's someone. Um, even if that person is not as experienced as you are, but if they know that room in that studio and they tell you that something always works in there, give it a try, you know, just do it. I've heard an interview once with uh, Joe Ciccarelli, which is, you know, he's one of the biggest producers uh, ever. And he's worked on some, some, you know, very, very big major records and that we all love. And, and, and he's a genius. But he said once when he goes, he was asked like where his favorite spot is. Uh, to put the drums at in, in, in any room where it was like, they asked like, where if you walk into a room, where do you put the drums? Like, is it the corner? Is it the center of the room? Is there any favorite thing? And he said, I start with whatever the assistant or the runner or whoever is there tells me yeah. to do. That's what I start with Absolutely. because they've been on a lot of sessions in that uh, studio and they know what a good place to put the drum kit is and they know which mics they set up and, and I'll start with that. And if I don't like it, I'll change it. But I always listen to those first. And he could be like, well, I know because I've made all these Grammy winning records, right? But no, he just does whatever they tell him because they know that studio. So Yeah, yeah. Provided this is a symbol that a studio that has put out good work. Yeah, yeah, of course, um, of course. Yeah, you got to. This, yeah, this backfired good, on me once. Yes, and I regret it. Yeah, but. yeah, for, for sure, for sure. But assume, I always assume first that like, uh, you know, people kind of know what they're doing. It's not always the case, but yeah, um, at least give it a try. And um, absolutely, know. absolutely, yeah. No, it's a no-brainer. Another like red or not red flag, opposite of red flag, indi leading indicator that it's a good decision is like you know if there's like one cab that looks permanently set up. It's already mic'd, you know, like, okay. <laughs> or it's got the, you know, the tape marks for where they put oh, their yeah. mic. Um, it's like, that's a good sign, you know, keep that in your, your back pocket. Yeah, absolutely. And then finally, you want to be able, or not finally, like you do that as one of the very first things, but, and, and rightfully so, I think, uh, you should fi figure out a spot in the room or a way to like monitor properly. Could be a pair of headphones, could be um, a spot for the monitors, but just f in a new room, it's very important to find a way to monitor that feels kind of familiar because that is always some that's the one thing that always gets me when I get into a new room that's always tricky and the same was was true on that houseboat they had you know they had great monitors there they had um, Adams that I'm used to because I have similar ones not the same but similar they had Neumann monitors you are more familiar with those Malcolm but still they are not the exact models that we use and it's a different room and so we are kind of you know, we, we couldn't fully trust the, the whole system. And uh, yeah, it was without headphones, it was very difficult for me to make good decisions just because of the different monitoring environment. So I'm glad I brought my headphones. That made things easier. But it's, uh, yeah, it's very important that you create some way of, of like, yeah, l being able to listen to something that you can, you can trust and that feels familiar. Absolutely, yeah. Bring some, bring some headphones. Um, I'm a big fan of bringing some treatment if you're not using a like actual studio. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're just converting a space, um, you know, you need just something to make it work or make treatment out of whatever you need to, kind of thing, uh, for that environment. You need to know that you can make decisions, right? So monitoring is very important to me. Totally, absolutely, cool. And then Malcolm, you have a list there as well of things where uh, where you put like 
Pre-production includes studio prep, um, you know, and all the things you can ask for in advance before you even go to that new room, if it's a studio or a gem space that you go into and you're not creating your own. Totally. And some studios will have this like listed on their website actually already. Some will have like the document saved. So it's not actually that big of an ask. It seems like a big ask, but, um, and you could just save this as a template email really easy, but I'll just list them off because we kind of touched on a bunch of yeah. these really, but like get an IO sheet, you know, then so that's going to like their available inputs and outputs puts in kind of patch-based structure, ideally. Um, uh, a gear list, so you know what they have for microphones, stands, uh, compressors, EQs, input, like preamps, all of it, you know, a gear list. Yeah. <laughs> um, how many headphones they have, you know, like that stuff can be really important. Um, ask what's broken, because they'll send you that gear list and forget to tell you that four of the eight preamps don't work. Yeah. <laughs> or they only work if you use a certain cable or some stupid thing, yeah. you know? Um, uh, yeah, ask what's broken. That's because, yeah, you are you don't want to, like, write down your entire plan and then find out that it, you can't use it. Um, or, or, computer, or you think, sorry, or you think you broke a mic and like kind of freak out for two days until you figure out it was just a back cable and the mic is actually not broken. <laughs> like in our case, uh, you know, yeah, things like I don't that. know what you're talking about, Benny. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, that could, things like that could happen, you know, if you, yeah, just ask for things yeah. that are broken. So, no. yes, hundred percent. No, that's great. Um, you know, inquiring about what kind of computer you're using, I think is wise. Um, just in case you're like, think, I don't know. I think that's just wise to know what you're working on. Uh, you know, login details. <laughs> um, like, is the iLock included? Yeah. Or do you need to bring your own? That's like some studios operate, like bring your own license, which is crazy to me. But yeah. that is a, a thing. Uh, plugin list. You know, it's some people need certain plugins for their workflow. Yeah. Um, which is fine. So, but you need to know if they're there or again, bring your own license and do that time. The prep will include installing plugins that you need. Yep. That's, yeah, that's a thing. Um, oh, here's another good one. Ask for photos of the room. And this works, this is like doubly important if it's not an actual studio, I yeah. think. Um, but like, this will give you such a good idea of like plotting out how you're going to set up the band in that space in advance. And um, also, you know, plugins or photos uh, can give you more like idea of what gear is actually there because gear lists notoriously are out of date. Yeah. Um, so you might see some stuff in the photos that might be there, you know, might have been brought in for that session, but gives you a good idea. And and also what instruments are available and if they need to be rented or if they're included in the price, that's huge as well. Yeah, 100%. Yep. Uh, yeah, big list. Yeah, list, exactly. <laughs> yeah, um, so... Uh, what can we say to the people who are like, well, we we will probably never, you know, rent out a studio or go to like to do any anything like that, like the DIY bands, which is a big part of our audience. Like, what if? I mean, most of that still applies, as I said. If you build yeah. your own studio, if you you know switch jam spaces, whatever, most of this applies. Um, but uh, is there anything else we could we could tell those people? Well, I mean, I think the big benefit of this episode actually is that I hope that some people that don't have studio setups or rooms large enough to record drums or something have not been like, oh, I could just rent a studio if we wanted to yeah. try that with my band. And that like that's huge. Yeah. Do that. You can you're you're from learning the stuff you're learning on this podcast and maybe through Benny's coaching and our courses is making you a producer. Yes. So you don't need to own a studio. You can just go use one. Yes, absolutely. And uh, yeah, if you want to learn those like signal flow basics, engineering basics that I was talking about, the necessary stuff, um, you can take our mix ready course. Like this is a not too big of an investment. You can do that. Um, it will get you up to speed. And uh, so this prepares you for situations like that. And if you want to take it further and really know what you're doing and be like become a producer in a way or your own producer for your own records, but then also who knows if you, you might collaborate with others or record your friends like I did, um, then apply for coaching and, you you know, it's yeah. exactly what we do here. So this is the way you learn these basics, uh, and and yeah, there's there's some there's a minimum requirement of of skills that you just need to have in order to to make situations like that work. And many people are lacking these skills, and uh, yeah, you have to have them. Cool. All right. Thank you for listening to this episode. Let us know if you have any questions, as always. And uh, I'll, yeah, we'll talk to you next week. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Hope you enjoyed this. Bye.